Hello, and welcome to the Future Christian Podcast, your source for insights and ideas into what it means to live as a follower of Jesus in the 21st century. At the Future Christian Podcast, we talk to pastors, authors, and other faith leaders for helpful advice and practical wisdom to help you and your community of faith walk boldly into the future. Here's your host, Lauren Richmond Jr. Hey, and thanks for listening in to the Future Christian Podcast. My name is Lauren Richmond, and I'm pleased today to be joined by Ryan Panzer. Hello. Hey, Lauren. Thanks for having me on the podcast today. Yeah, thanks for being here. Uh, welcome, welcome. And uh, I keep thinking, who's that? As I'm looking at Ryan, I'm easily distracted. We're on video together. Who's who's that? Uh, who's the football player off your right shoulder there? Our viewers cannot see. So that's a life-size uh, picture. It's a fat head of J.J. Watt, the Wisconsin Badger, that's great right. now with the Houston Texans. Uh, yeah, he's standing over my shoulder in every one of my Zoom calls. I, I think it keeps people on their toes when they're when they're talking to me. <laughs> Maybe they know if they drift off too much onto social media, they've they've got a three hundred pound defensive lineman coming straight at them. <laughs> That's right. I forgot. Uh, JJ Watt went to Wisconsin. Yeah. Well, awesome. Let me read you. Uh, let's tell you, tell our listeners your bio here. Uh, Ryan is a learning and leadership development professional in the technology industry. He's a student of digital media and its influence on our lives. He's especially interested in the intersection of faith and technology. He lives in Madison, Wisconsin, hence the Wisconsin fathead with his wife, Annie. And uh, you can find out more about him and his writings at ryanpanzer.com. Um, Ryan, do you, have a, what's your, do you have an MBA, MDiv from Luther Seminary? Yeah, I have an MA from Luther. Graduated in 2019. Awesome. Cool. Congratulations there. Well, Ryan, what else would you like our listeners to know about you? Well, my whole story has been bouncing between the, the often disparate worlds of, of church and tech. When I was going through through college, I worked as a camp counselor at, at Pine Lake Camp, a, a Christian summer camp in Wapaka, Wisconsin. Believe it or not, that led me to a job at Google right out of college. Mm. They were fascinated by the story I told them on my interview of how man how I managed to restart fires in the rain so kids could eat their blueberry pancakes and restring tent poles uh, so kids didn't get soaked during their overnight campouts. Uh, they, nice. they thought that was innovation and I agree. I love uh, I love church camp uh, church camp innovation that's great. I well think so tell many us... of the, the most innovative Oh, sorry. I think so many, of, go, so go many of the most innovative leaders in the in the church uh, have some kind of a background in, in camp, camping ministry, uh, either as a counselor or a naturalist or a day camp teacher. Uh, it's just so many interesting problems to solve, so many interesting ways of, of relating to kids that, that you get access to through camping ministry. Well, I think without getting too deep into this, I think you're right on because many moons ago I went to Bible college with a youth ministry degree, and I didn't do a lot in youth camp or children's camp but in my limited experience Dick, you really have to be able to think on your feet because you're you're kind of stuck there and you have limited resources and you've got to make it work and keep those kids entertained or it's gonna be it's gonna be awful it's a whole staff of macgyvers yeah yeah well uh in your book you kind of talk about your journey of faith but tell our listeners a little bit about um growing up as a christian and then kind of how your faith has grown and developed Sure. So uh, I grew up as a as a uh, Lutheran in in Wisconsin. Grew up in Northeast Wisconsin. Uh, currently live in live in Madison. So all throughout that time, uh, my faith has been formed through these really strong communities uh, situated with a really strong sense of of, of place and space. Um, communities where. Uh, people came to church buildings to see musicals, where people came to church buildings to learn and to worship, and and I really think I experienced the best of church growing up. I mean, the ministries I was involved with were were models of what a successful ministry was in the 1990s and and early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And and I think what's been interesting is even though I, I experienced these really strong ministries with this grounded sense of place and space. I found myself uh, gravitating towards uh, more digital forms of, 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 of Christianity. 
Uh, so mm-hmm. as I was immersed in the technology worlds of Google, where I had my first career as I attended seminary online, I started to realize that maybe church wasn't just about a physical structure at a specific geographic address, but was mm-hmm. more about a way of of being with the world, of relating to God and to one another, and of being in service towards the neighbor. And that maybe that didn't require that sense of place and space like I like I once thought. Hmm. Yeah, important questions here. I'm curious, like, how did seminary fit in? Because uh, I'm revealing my bias here, uh, Ryan. I think about how hard seminary is, how much work it is, how little like career options you get from it. How did yeah. how did someone working for Google be like, hmm, I want to go to seminary? It sounds like a, 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 a good idea that someone ought to pursue. Well, I'll tell you, Google has a tuition reimbursement program, and there's not a huge reimbursement for non-career relevant um, mm-hmm. uh, studies. I, I think I got $200 or something for my seminary studies, the same I would have gotten as if I was taking a, a cooking class. But I, I remember <laughs> filling out the form and sending it off to Google Human Resources. And I think to this day, I'm still the only person, probably hundreds of thousands that have worked for Google, uh, to put a seminary down as the institution of, of learning. So it was, it was definitely, <laughs> it was definitely uh, at, at times a, a lonely journey. Um, mm, what was yeah. unique is that my seminary studies were, were primarily uh digital. They were primarily online. Mm -hmm. So lunch breaks or or after work, um, I'd take off to a coffee shop. Uh, I'd I'd go do my studies, conjugating Greek verbs, debating the authorship of Hebrews, uh, thinking Mm -hmm. about the future of of what it means to to be a missional church community. Uh, And and then during the day, I was working in this this high-tech, fast-paced Google environment. Yeah. I did similarly uh, seminary online mostly in I didn't have uh, quite the good experience of working at a good firm like Google, but yeah, similarly trying to squeeze stuff in. Um, curious what spiritual practices you've developed that you found meaningful or might recommend to others? Well, I think the the, the one that's been most meaningful to me is the experience of a, a day, daily Sabbath that I've worked to to cultivate over the years. And when I think about my career in the technology industry, it's very fast paced. Most days mm-hmm. I have 50, 60 browser tabs open at once, I'm getting messages on Slack, I'm getting emails, I'm getting calendar notifications. There's just so much going on. And I wouldn't be able to navigate that, let alone pursue a seminary education and write about church and technology if I didn't push back with some, some room for some stillness, uh, mm-hmm. for some prayers, for some contemplation. So every day, uh, I I actually use the 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 calm app, the the, the daily calm, okay. uh, for for just about ten minutes of centering, and and then I uh, take a few minutes to to read a uh, read a devotional text. Right now, I'm reading "We Make the Road by Walking" by uh, by, by, yeah. by Brian McLaren, which which has been excellent, and uh, that that resource goes week by week, fifty two weeks throughout the year. So I just started it last week. Um, we'll yeah. see where where I'm at at the end of two thousand twenty one. Well, theoretically, everything going, if everything goes according to plan, your, your, this interview will air a couple after him. So, um, check out his new book if you haven't. Um, what is it called? Faith After Doubt. His new book. So, listeners, go back and listen to that after you listen to Ryan here today. I, I I'm, you know, it's funny that you said that uh, about the importance of daily Sabbath because immediately when I when I thought about you listen, you working for Google. And going to lunch, going after work, studying theology, so much of the reputation, I guess, of tech workers is this kind of like nonstop workaholism. And uh, I I imagine it's going to be real. You have to really be intentional about creating space for yourself. Yes. Yeah. And and I would add to that. It's not just necessarily a, a sense of workaholism. Um, as much as it is a, a hyper focus on achievement, on, on mm. getting things done, on doing things that are visibly impactful. So that, that's mm-hmm. why you see so many tech workers that are really highly connected to uh, like a, a nonprofit or some kind of a volunteer organization. Um, why so many tech workers give 
so much of their time to organizations like uh, a Habitat for Humanity or, 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 or food pantries. Um, tech workers always want to be on the go, doing things, making a difference. And mm-hmm. what I found is that it's so easy to get absorbed by that, that, that the whole experience just passes you by and, and you hardly take notice. You can achieve a whole lot, but what, what joy is there? Uh, hmm. what, what sense of grounding and discernment in, in, a, in a sense of vocation is there if you don't take the time to, to pause, to stop, to pray, uh, and to, to reflect? So good. Um, also, I thought I was a heavy browser user. With I have like 15 tabs open right now, but 5-0, uh, that's a good amount. Guessing you when have a you decent amount of memory. When you can't see the logo of the app on the browser tab, you know you've got a lot of browser tabs open. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's let's move on. Uh, Ryan recently uh, came out with a book called Grace and Gigabytes, Being Church in a Tech-Shaped Culture, uh, which we're here to talk about today. So first, Ryan, tell us just kind of like how you came upon like, hey, I'm going to write a book and here's what I want to say. Tell us that background. Well, all those years of studying theology, working at Google, you know, it kind of feels at times isolating. Like these these worlds couldn't be more different. So yeah. I almost needed to write this book to bring together these two worlds that I was so passionate about because mm-hmm. I thought that the two worlds had so much to learn from one another. Yeah. And when I look at what the, the world of church has to learn about technology, what I had seen is so many well thought out faith communities using church or using technology rather as this shiny object. You know, if we just yeah. take it, uh, enough technology and we polish it up enough and we throw it out there, then all these young people are going to see it and they're going to yep. be attracted to it and they're going to come and be at our church. And so I saw technology being used as like a really expensive fishing lure. Yeah. And I thought, what if us and we in the church started think of thinking of technology more so as this process that's so deeply embedded in who we are, the way we think, the way we believe, the way we know, and and started thinking about the ways technology is acting on our culture. Because when we throw a lot of technology, a lot of shiny tech objects in the in the waters, well, all of those technologies are, are bound to, 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 to come and go so quickly. Yeah. But it's the way that technology is altering the way we think, the way we believe, the way we relate to one another, that's yeah. going to have lasting impacts, you know, for, for years and decades to come. Yeah. Um, you have some great quotes in the book that I want to, um, well, I guess I'm not going to read them word for word, but kind of I want to hear more about them. Um, you write about being church in the digital age. And this kind of, I guess, goes to what you just said about the, the, the tendency to just use tech as a shiny object. Um, but you write about being church in the digital age isn't about technology, but about engagement. Tell us more about that. When, when we think about the digital age, um, we ought to think less about technology as a tool for, for, for gathering. We ought to think about technology as a tool for um, enabling and empowering Christians to um, be the hands of, and feet of Christ in, in the world. So, so that's mm-hmm. what that difference is. Technology isn't just a, a high-powered bulletin board. Um, te- mm-hmm. Technology is a tool. And, and what we ought to be using that tool for is, is, is helping um, our faith communities and helping those around us uh, to be more grounded in their Christian identity so that they can live a life of faith uh, consistently in their day-to-day lives. You know, uh, day-to-day lives are, are, are mundane. Right now, they're, 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 they're somewhat tedious. Uh, they're somewhat mm-hmm. anxiety-provoking. Um, we can use church to enable Christians to live and walk out their life of faith within this strange moment we're, we're living in. So, so that's really the difference between, um, or that's really what engagement is all about, using technology to enable, to empower Christians to be who they were called to be. So if I'm hearing you right, uh, thinking about this in a practical example, like we both come from mainline church contexts. Um, you know, 
in a mainline church context and certainly 10 or 20 years earlier in many evangelical context, like utilizing technology would have been like putting words on a screen and that would have been seen as like, you know, adapting to technology. But you're going after, if I'm hearing you right, not necessarily just like incorporating more tech into the worship gathering, but like, I don't know, uh, utilizing mass texting options to to communicate with people about volunteer opportunities, something like that? Yeah, that could be one option. You know, so when, when we think about uh, the way churches typically think about technology, you're right. They think of the screens in the sanctuary. They think about mm-hmm. the words. They think about the production of the music and the production of the yeah. video. W- what the book gets into is how technology has uh, formed us in this very particular way of being in community one- with one another not just inside of the church, but as, as a culture. It's a way of community that values asking questions, that values mm-hmm. collaborating, that values creating and connecting in ways that, that blur the lines between online and offline. So, mm-hmm. so when we talk about technology use in the church, uh, I'm less interested in how shiny we can make our worship services and more interested in how can we make space for the questions in church, knowing that our culture has been primed to ask a lot of questions by tools mm-hmm. like Google, what does that look like at the, at the level of the church? Yeah. That's fundamentally what I, the book I, is about. I know. I think one of the things that I found helpful in the book, um, and I'd recommend this for folks curious, is you have like a kind of like a what high tech, low tech, and no tech type action step. I think at the end of the chapter, it's like your thing about asking questions. Um, what you have something like have you could you could create a system where people are texting in questions essentially during the service or I don't, that was the high tech I don't remember the low tech or the no tech but I, I mean I, I'm even trying to do something right now here we are early January in my church where uh, I, th- I thought about like watching something on video like we're doing what a lot of churches are doing now because of COVID is like it's really not super engaging uh, so I'm creating, I'm trying to create like a Zoom kind of afterwards group where we can like, hey, here's a question based on the sermon message. What do you think? Uh, to try to create some yeah. dialogue. Um, I want to ask you about, you talk about the misalignment of values between online and church. And I think, I think many pastors or church leaders would think they know what those values values are that are misaligned, but I I feel like reading your book, you might have a different opinion about what those actually misaligned values are. Well, I'll give you one example. Uh, And and I think it goes back to this idea that uh, technology is this tool for for marketing and for sharing information. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, technology can do that, but but technology is, is fundamentally this this force that's acting on our culture that's causing us to prioritize these different ways of being in being in community. So when I think about the misalignment between church and digital age, that's what I'm writing about. The idea that so many faith leaders uh, see th- see technology, see these tools uh, as a way of posting information, getting more people into the seats, getting more dollars into the coffer, uh, mm-hmm. when they should be thinking about the values that those who are, are part of our communities uh, really hold dear. Uh, that's what the misalignment is. Um, and so when we think about like who's using uh, technologies effective in the digital age, you can be a high budget evangelical megachurch uh, with, with professionalized media staff that have worked in Hollywood. You can be a mountain west rural parish with 10 people in your congregation and, and no Wi-Fi. And you can do it equally well. It, mm, what matters yeah. isn't so much the technologies we use, but it's how we deploy them and the intentionality that we use alongside them. Well, that's some good, that's some good words there. That's some good words. Um, you hinted at it, uh, these kind of, or you used the, the four words of questions, connection, collaboration, creativity. And in fact, in your book, you kind of highlight these four values uh, without kind of giving away the entire content of the book. Uh, can you speak more to those kind of four values and how they uh, fit into the, the core concept of the book? Sure. So each one of these values uh, is something you'll find uh, hardwired into our most ubiquitous technologies. 
I start with questions because of how search technologies have conditioned us to ask lots of questions in every aspect of our life. You know, mm -hmm. what is Alexa other than a high tech device for asking questions and asking lots and yeah. lots of questions? Uh, collaboration. Good thing I'm wearing, I give, I thing give, I'm wearing headphones or she might hear you. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, I, and I've seen that on Zoom calls that I've been on where, where somebody says the word Google and next thing you know, everyone's phone is going off trying to do a search or something <laughs> like that. Each one of these values has a uh, ubiquitous technology uh, that's associated with it. Creativity, for example, I look at Instagram and YouTube and how these tools give us the capacity to be creators and tellers of our own story. And, and then on the mm. other side of that is what, what do we do with that as, as church? Well, yeah. it doesn't mean we have to be on Instagram and YouTube so much as it means our communities expect opportunities to tell their own stories and to do so yeah. creatively. What does that look like? And yeah. again, if I'm a mega church with 50 people on my media staff or a rural parish in, in Idaho with no Wi-Fi, I can give people the space to tell their stories in all of its richness and creativity. Uh, it doesn't matter if I'm on YouTube or Instagram or not. The, the values are shaped and informed by technology, but our response to church as church can be decidedly low tech. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, I got to I gotta ask a hard question here. Um, I was thinking about this, and, and I know you speak highly. I don't know if highly is the right word, but definitely you see the pros in like things like YouTube and such, and... And I think about this as you being a Lutheran and I think about uh, our friend Martin Luther and the priest of all believers and this kind of democratization of theology and religion. I was reflecting on this when I was in my basement working out with my daughter and she was watching this YouTube channel called Dr. Squish. For those I don't know who are not familiar with Dr. Squish, uh, this millennial woman who like gets millions of views of literally just cutting open like squishy stuff. Uh, I'm thinking about like Dr. Pimple Popper, who also has a huge following just from like popping zits. And I mean, YouTube, you know, probably better than I do is just filled with this kind of like, worthless, stupid content. Uh, so that is the one question and pushback I'd have Ryan, you know, it, it, is there some loss like, are, is the church, is Christianity, is theology losing something in this kind of, like, democratization, um, everyone having a voice, uh, the kind of the equalization of voices, that kind of thing? The church isn't necessarily losing something when everyone has a voice. Uh, in fact, the church's best opportunity is to give everyone a voice. The question okay. is where is our community rooted when we give the, when we give everyone that platform and, and where do we, um, where do we derive our sources of, of authenticity, of agency, of authority from? And, and that's why I think it's so important to be grounded in scripture, to be grounded in spiritual practice and to be grounded in intentional community, because you're right. If we all go off on our own, making silly pimple popping videos, then there isn't much of an interesting future for, for, for the church. But mm -hmm. when, when we tell our stories and w we hold them up to the narrative arcs in scripture, when, when we um, accompany storytelling through acts of intentional listening and contemplation, then giving everyone the democratized platform is a really beautiful and meaningful thing. In fact, I think it's perhaps what church is called to, to be. Hmm. So th there, there is, there is a, a, a fine line between hmm. Dr. Pimple Popper and uh, <laughs> a church that's, that's making a fine use of, of, of technology. I would encourage churches to boldly innovate, to experiment, mm -hmm. to test new approaches, and to constantly reevaluate, am I more so the Dr. Pimple Popper, uh, or, or am I truly being an authentic expression of church, living out our mission and vision and our call as to who, and our call as to what God is calling us here to be. First of all, that was a great answer to my kind of crazy question. Uh, so kudos there. I'm curious, does that look like, like guardrails? What does that look like? I mean, if, if I'm the pastor of this kind of church, like what is my role? So I wouldn't necessarily use the word guardrails. I'd use the word facilitation. Um, if I'm mm -hmm. the pastor of a church, 
my job is to be uh, a curator of the of the voices that are going to be part of the conversation. Um, when I when I invite the democratized telling of stories, uh, I, I want to make sure that those stories are 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 told. Um, with with the right resources again the right narrative arcs from from scripture and and in the mm-hmm. right settings so so the pastoral call in the digital age is is to curate the other voices that are going to be part of our stories uh to make sure that there's some structure to the storytelling environments we create mm-hmm. but then to be a consistent convener of opportunities to tell those stories um so many especially in 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 men's groups are reluctant to share their stories of faith. My hope yeah. is that after living through really three separate crises now with a political upheaval, with the pandemic, with, yeah. uh, with, with the systemic racism we're living through in this country, mm-hmm. that, that more people will be forthcoming about their faith stories and willing to share. And, and so it's, it's my hope that, that pastors will consistently offer that invitation um, to share your story as, especially as we look forward to the the new normal uh, that, that awaits us towards the end of this year. Hmm. I'm thinking about, um, I grew up Baptist and testimonies was a very, I don't, I don't want to say like common, but it was a fairly regular thing for there to be testimony nights and thinking about how meaningful that was. Um, you know, and, and I'm sure you can, I got to imagine church camp, you heard many kids stories and, you know, there can be stories can be good and bad and it can be manipulated for good and bad. And I guess that's where the curator part comes in, right? They can be manipulated for good or bad. Um, stories can quickly go awry as any content creator can, can, yeah. can tell you. Yeah. And I, you know, as, as a, as a, as a Lutheran, uh, I used to go on these, these mission trips every summer, uh, with my church and, and we'd often go to uh, a state in the Southern United States and part of that mission trip would be a visit to a Baptist church where, where we were yeah, able to hear nice. uh, testimony. Not something we had in uh, Wisconsin, uh-huh. uh, Lutheran churches as I was growing up, but a powerful experience. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm sure testimonies can be great and testimonies can be can be not so great. I'd like to think of pastors uh, of the digital age being less about preaching and more about coaching. Um, when, mm. when, when you're a pastor your task, your call is to help those in your community to refine their story, to, 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 mm. to, to, to take the rough edges uh, and, and smooth them out so that the story will be told and also listened to. Yeah, I love it. That's a great point. That's a great point there. Um, I want to, sh- I've been kind of peppering you with some uh, hard questions here, kind of off track. I want to kind of dive into some more practical stuff, if that's okay. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess the first question is like, um, and this is, I guess this is not, not so much practical, but I think it is very practical. Um, the idea of being okay with failure, uh, in churches, I don't know about your church experience, but I, I know many of, in my context, resources are often thin and there's the pressure to, to kind of squeeze every dollar, squeeze every penny. Um, and that kind of really, in my experience, like really creates this like paranoia against failure. And I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but if there's one thing that I feel like is true of the tech world, it's like, there's not that fear of failure. Is that, is that there's fair? Not a fear. Yeah, I would say that's fair. Uh, there's not a fear of failure because we know we can change fast enough to make our, our greatest failures. Um, if, if not, you know, so bad, we can at least, we can at least change things so quickly that they're quickly out of out of sight, out of mind, out of memory. Mm-hmm. Now in the church, um, there, there certainly is a fear of seeming, um, imperfect. There's a fear of seeming unpolished. Uh, mm-hmm. part of that, I think you know, it just deals with the scope of, um, what we're talking about here. We're, we're, we're talking about the biggest questions of life, of who we are, of who God has created us to be. There's a little more at stake here than, you know, do we put 120 characters in a tweet or 240 <laughs> characters in a tweet? 280, so it's, it's right? It's okay that there's, that there's this fear of, of failure. Um, you know, look, with when, when, when the pandemic ends, um, we're going to enter this new phase of, of being church where we're going to have to figure out a new way of, of, of being Christian community. 
And yeah. we have to learn to fail and fail fast. Um, we're going to have to learn to test new models to figure out how we take the best of what we learn from, from our technology use and, and put it alongside the best of in-person community. And that's going to mm-hmm. take so much trial and, and, and error, much more trial and error than we've, than we've ever been accustomed to in, 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 in Christian leadership. My hope. Well, I got, and I I got two pre- follow-up questions I want to ask, uh, but yeah. I'll, I'll save the, I want to ask the hard one first. Um, what is, do you, I mean, I'm thinking structure here. Um, again, we both come from mainline traditions with very established kind of organizations and governance kind of structures. Um, evangelical churches, I think, tend to operate with a more, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong here, what, what I would perceive as more business type leadership approach. Um, do you do you see structure as something that w- needs to change to allow for faster change or more adaption? Well, it's interesting because when you talk about structures, especially in a mainline context, uh, it's it's really hard to change things like bylaws, like constitutions, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which we have in abundance in, in the mainline tradition. Mm-hmm. What it's easier to change is mission and and values and we should be Mm. always reflecting and resetting mission and values particularly during and after times of of upheaval and and crisis yeah i guess i'm less interested in changing the formal bureaucratic structures that govern the church and more interested in in knowing that all churches have an updated sense of call and mission and that That's everybody good. who's That's part good. of that faith community can articulate it. You know, how many yeah. churches have a mission statement and nobody knows it? Then what good is it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Know your mission statement. Reset it. You know, set your mission statement in community. That, to me, is is far more important than, than, than structures. And I hope mm-hmm. is a practice that we can all get into as we approach a new normal. Yeah, that's hard to disagree with. Hard to disagree with. Okay, the second part of the question then is on a more practical level. Like, this is a question I was going to ask you. Like, what do you think? I mean, we are what in mid January. Like, I'm hoping and praying. Like, I have dreams of Easter, but that seems far fetched. Like, I mean, let's pray to God. It's like summer, uh, maybe fall. Like, what do you? What's your advice for churches? Um, I mean, this is, uh, this will probably come out like, you know, mid spring, probably, uh, as we're beginning to kind of process these things and think about it. What's your advice for churches? Like what should we keep? What should we dump? That kind of thing. Well, so the, the transition to hybrid ministry, which is you know hybrid of online and offline experiences is, is underway yeah. and we should be actively engaging that transition. The things you can do right now be in conversation with your faith community about what they appreciate about online church. What's good that they want to take with them because we don't want to lose sight of that. We've developed so many Mm -hmm. skills and so many capabilities over these 10, 11 months. Let's make sure we're taking the best of the best with us. The second thing that we can be doing right now, again, is going back to our mission and our values Everybody who's lived mm-hmm. through the through, through really these crises is not the same person they were in February 2020, nor are our churches. Start having conversations yeah. about what that call really looks like. Our technology use ought to follow from that call. Um, we shouldn't just say, well, we streamed worship and we're going to continue streaming worship because it's the right thing to do. You know, I think you probably should stream worship, but but at least have a sense <laughs> of why. You know, how is that connected yeah. to our call? How is that connected to, to to what we're here to do? Yeah, I love it. I love it. This emphasis on mission and vision. Like, if you if you you know, certainly you'll make mistakes and miss the boat. Um, it's I think it's impossible not to, but I feel like you're going to be less likely to do so if you're trying to aim for mission and vision every time. So this is a great point. 100%. Um, let me ask one more question then. Uh, imagine like I'm the, you know, I'm thinking about, I think in many mainline worlds, like the millennial was kind of like the, 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 what's the word? The great white whale. What's the blanket on? 
Oh, they're like the gold novel. standard uh, Moby Dick. <laughs> yeah, we'll use that. We'll use that metaphor. Um, which I think we've already missed out on many mainline churches. But like, if you were like coaching like a a pastor on like, hey, here's how to reach tech workers. Yeah. What do you have to say? Kind of that demographic, we'll say. Okay, well, I'm gonna answer that question in two parts. So, part A. Yeah, go for it. Uh, if, if you're looking for uh, connecting with tech workers as a, as a pastor, um, you should know that that tech workers are going to want two things from your church. They're they're going to want a church that's open minded, where somebody can ask life's biggest mm-hmm. questions and explore the scriptures and learn about God and practice their faith, but to do so in an era in an area that's that's free of of judgment and pro curiosity, pro exploration. Just as they're also going mm-hmm. to want a strong commitment to social justice. Uh, they're going to want a strong commitment mm. to anti-racism. They're going to want to make sure you're making a difference in outreach to communities that that the church has often uh, marginalized and ostracized. So when when we think about like the younger generations, the tech workers, um, you know, those are my best friends mm-hmm. and coworkers. And if and if a church can do those two things, we can at least start a, a conversation. Now. Part B of that question, and 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 I got to give some attribution here to, to Kerry Newhoff on his Facebook page a few weeks ago, um, posted a, a prediction of a trend that <laughs> yeah. that the the most successful and vibrant churches will be those that equip church uh, equip Christians and not merely to to gather them. Uh, I, part of mm, being yeah. millennial is um, being kind of picky about where and when and how we gather. And being gathered on someone else's terms at yeah. someone else's building at a time of the week we'd rather be at brunch or setting our fantasy football lineups is sometimes a hard sell. <laughs> the equipping piece, though, is, yeah. is not. That's, a, that's something we're really interested in. We want to know how we can walk this walk, how we can, how we can live this life of faith, mm-hmm. how we can do justice and walk humbly with our Lord. The, the, that equipping piece is, is something that will find far more resonance in the millennial tech community than the gathering piece will. Yeah. Uh, well, we're getting all kinds of shout outs here. So Kerry Newhoff, uh, he, he can do us a favor then and give us a shout out the other way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. But I enjoy listening to Kerry Newhoff's podcast the other, uh, occasionally too. I think that's a great point. I was talking about that recently with someone too, about, um, like folks don't want to just gather just for the sake of gathering. Like there has to be some kind of broader purpose to it. Like that's going to call us together. Like, you know, it's not just like, I'm just going to come to church Sunday because that's why, you know, it's what I do. I'm like, why am I coming to church Sunday? I'm coming, like you said, to be equipped or to worship or to volunteer, to serve with others, whatever. And going back to what I suggested about my own spiritual practice, the whole reason I go to church on, on Sunday is to disconnect to rest from that sense of having to get things done, of having to achieve, of having to complete project after project. It really is that sense of Sabbath that keeps me coming back mm. to church and to spiritual practice. It, it, you know, your reason for gathering can be, can be broad and diverse as, as any, um, but just make sure it's known and articulated. Hmm. Uh, l- last question, I promise. Um, I- I've always wondered, like, could you do could like a could like a purposely like devoid of tech service work like thinking about your sabbath yeah if you were intentional not only would marketing it and presenting it as that not only would it would it uh you know would it work i think it would be exciting um you know, I look at like the holidays and how all my coworkers in the tech world were so excited to get off Zoom for a few days. Uh, yeah. If you pr- you proclaim that you're going to give this experience of Sabbath rest and connection, an embodied connection with with real community, with real human beings, for the sake of of, of living out one's faith and in service to the neighbor, I, I, I think that that would do really well. I just, I just kind of have this visual in my mind of like people coming in and like you have an offering plate and you're like, put your phone in the offering plate. Amen. I'm in. <laughs> Where do I go for that? Tell me what church and I'll show up. <laughs> Once COVID is over, we'll see. We'll see if I can make it happen in my church. 
Um, but, yeah, we might have to sanitize the phones first. But yeah, let's take a quick break and we'll come back for some closing questions. Is the church really dying, or is it dying to change? How can the church recapture what it was in the first century? A distinctive confessional community willing to stand against the status quo, to speak up against the empire, and to stand for the gospel. How can it do this in a 21st century context? This year, the Festival of Homiletics invites you into a conversation around how the promise of the gospel might shape hope and ministry for the future of the church. What is the role of preaching in forming the church of the future? Be inspired by God's word proclaimed by some of the nation's finest ministers and teachers. Experience the fellowship of hundreds of preachers. Learn and worship in an atmosphere that is dynamic, friendly, nurturing, and prophetic. Come renew, refresh, and recharge your spirit. Join the Festival of Homiletics this spring for the 29th Annual Preaching Conference. It will be broadcast virtually the week of May 17th to the 21st, 2021, and is free to all who register. Enjoy over 30 sessions from some of the best practitioners in the business. Michael Curry, Kate Baller, Diana Butler-Bass, Otis Moss II, Brian McLaren, Marilyn Robinson, Adam Russell-Taylor, and so many more. Register for free today at festivalofhomiletics.com. Are you a worship leader who is going through a faith shift while still trying to produce 52 services a year? Are you a lead pastor who is dealing with high turnover on your creative team? Torn Curtain Arts exists to strengthen the creative soul of the local church by providing coaching, creative consulting, and interim worship leaders from our team with 20 years experience in the trenches of ministry. We help leaders get off the ministry treadmill of chasing Sunday after Sunday. Learn more about how we can help you and your team by visiting torncurtainarts.org. All right, we're back with Ryan Panzer, and uh, Ryan said he was excited for these closing questions, so I am excited to hear his answers. <laughs> Ryan, uh, if you were Pope for a day, what do you want to do? What's that about? You know, if if, if I'm Pope for the, for for a day, I'm, I'm going to go out there and use my platform uh, to remind Christians that uh, this is a time where we can either tear apart or bring together. Let's bring to mm-hmm. let's bring people together. Let's let's choose to create community and not divide community. Good message. That's a good message. Uh, what theologian or historical Christian figure would you want to meet or bring back to life? You know, I think I'm obligated in some ways to say Martin Luther, but I'm not going to say Martin <laughs> Luther. I'm going to say Fred Rogers, yeah. Mr. Rogers. Fred I mean, Rogers. I didn't realize he was yeah. a Methodist minister until I, I saw that documentary last last year, but. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the, 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 the kindness and compassion that Mr. Rogers shows towards his neighbors uh, throughout his years of doing the show is an exemplary model yeah. of, of faithful living. And I would love to take a seminary course from that man. I think I've appreciated some of the, like this when I've looked back, uh, some of the subtle ways that he was like, what's the word? Like he was like subtly ways that he was like. Um, social justice oriented, I guess. I, I don't know how to say it better than that. Um, yeah, uh, like I remember, man was an uh, African American, and uh, yeah, yeah, you know, he he shared the foot bath with the African American, and yeah. how you know the, the documentary talks about how how radical of an act that was. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and so he was a justice warrior uh, in in a in a sweater vest. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, I also think about just kind of the ways that I feel like we could use someone who could speak with a, a sense of calm and um, non-anxious presence right now. Um, yeah, you know, you really can. Looking back, you can kind of really see how his ministry training really aided him well there. I, I'm so. This is kind of off topic, uh, Ryan, but I was seeing on Twitter something trending about Mrs. Rogers. Is that really, I don't know if you're on Twitter. I saw that. I was wondering what that is about. It, if that's related, <laughs> I have not seen that one myself, but I'll have to look that up. <laughs> well, what do you think history will remember uh, from this current time and place? Well, there's 
there there are going to be so many things that that history remembers historians will be studying yeah. in 2020 and 2021 for centuries to come um I, I think what what will be immediately remembered is that uh some met this moment with compassion and love for their neighbor and uh some met this moment with with derision and scorn and the mm-hmm. the models the heroes of this story will be those who 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 met this moment with kindness and compassion um in attempt to bring people together i love that answer you know i was thinking i was um think about it like a think about like what are the movies that are going to be made about 2020 and now maybe 2021 it's like you've got a pandemic movie for sure um you know right. that's gonna like that's gonna like feature like a nurse and a doctor like going crazy in a hospital dealing with covid patients you have like there's yep. gonna be a social justice movie dealing with the the racial unrest and the unjust killings of so many african-american people and then now you're gonna have like a political <laughs> insurrection movie yeah it's like, like you know I, enough, I, I wonder enough. If, like will that be a trilogy or will they just pack that all into <laughs> one film we'll have to see Ryan, we have to market that one. <laughs> Good stuff. All right. Uh, hopeful question here, Ryan. What do you hope for the future of Christianity? That Christianity will be become fluent in helping people uh, to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. Mm, that's good. That's good. All right, Ryan, where can people find out more about you and uh, get a copy of your book? Sure. So the book is available wherever books are sold online. The title is Grace and Gigabytes, Being Church in a Tech-Shaped Culture. And for more writings and resources, uh, check out my website, www.ryanpanzer.com. We just started a new blog series about becoming an, becoming a hybrid church, looking ahead to the transition to the, to our new normal. So check it out. Send me a few comments. I'd love to hear what you think. Yeah, awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time, Ryan. Really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, May God's peace be with you. And also with you. Thanks for joining us on the Future Christian Podcast. To learn more about Lauren or the podcast, visit future-christian.com. But hey, before you go, do us a favor. Subscribe to the podcast and leave a review. It really helps us get the word out to more people. Thanks, and go in peace.